Welcome to the Academic Engagement Network's webinar, Teaching About Antisemitism on Campus, Cross-Disciplinary Perspectives. I'm Miriam Elman. I'm the Executive Director of AEN. AEN is now in its seventh year. We are an educational nonprofit that mobilizes and supports the needs of faculty in the face of rising antisemitism in the American Academy. AEN's mission is to create a strong network of faculty who can respond effectively to campus challenges and create and maintain a healthy and robust campus discourse about Jewish identity, Zionism, the Jewish experience, and Israel. We are proud to count over 800 faculty across all ranks and disciplines in our network, and they teach at some 250 campuses nationwide. And because AEN members teach, and many are teaching right now, We'll be recording the webinar so they can view it later. With us today are four of our faculty members, each at a different stage in their academic careers, each from different disciplines, and they will share their experiences, their perspectives and challenges, their recommendations and best practices in educating their campus communities about anti-Semitism. We're delighted that this webinar will launch AEN's year-long project to gather syllabi on the topic of anti-Semitism for an open access syllabi bank that will feature on our website. At a time of rising anti-Semitism in the United States and with campuses not immune from it, we see this as, an, as essential to be able to offer this and many other educational resources as a means for countering these toxic forces. And before I turn the floor over to my colleague who will introduce our four panelists, let me just take a moment to mention that this program is being presented in partnership with the Shine a Light on Antisemitism Initiative, a coalition of over 60 organizations in North America that have come together to illuminate the dangers of antisemitism during the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights. We are most grateful for the generous financial support provided by the Shine a Light initiative that has made this webinar possible. And let me now turn to my colleague in the AEN leadership team, Rafa Shams. Thank you, Miriam. I'm Rafa Shams. I'm Director of Communications and Programming at AEN, and I have the pleasure of briefly introducing our four faculty panelists. Before I do so, I would just like to note that the chat will be open during the initial discussion. So please feel free to write any questions you may have into the chat box. We'll begin asking these during the Q&A. So on to our panelists. Rachel Harris is Associate Professor of Israeli Literature and Culture in Comparative and World Literature and the Program in Jewish Culture and Society at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her, her recent publications include An Ideological Death, Suicide in Israeli Literature, and Warriors, Witches, Whores, Women in Israeli Cinema. She is the editor of the newly published Casting a Giant Shadow, The Transnational Shaping of Israeli Cinema, and Teaching the Arab-Israeli Conflict, and co-editor of Narratives of Dissent, War and Contemporary Israeli Arts and Culture. She received her PhD from Oxford University. Meyer Muller is Assistant Professor of Early Childhood Education at the University of South Carolina. His expertise focuses on issues of racial equity, constructivist theory and pedagogy, Jewish education, social studies education, and pre-service teacher preparation. An ordained rabbi, he earned his PhD from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. James Nemirov is visiting assistant professor of Spanish at Kalamazoo College, with his research focusing on the representation of Judaism in 16th and 17th century Spanish literature. He was previously a lecturer of Spanish at Iowa State University, and he received his PhD in Romance Languages and Literatures from the University of Chicago. And finally, Avinoam Pat is the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies and Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. He previously served in positions at the University of Hartford and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He's the author and or editor or co-editor of numerous volumes about the Holocaust and its aftermath. Most recently, Laughter After Humor and the Holocaust and Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. He received his PhD from U New York University. Thank you, Rachel, Meyer, James, and Avi. We're all looking forward to hearing your remarks. 
Now back to Miriam for the first question. Great, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask questions of each of the panelists and allow each one of them a few minutes uh, to address them as we go through um, our three questions. So our first question is, could you please describe the process of creating your course? Um, why did you decide to teach it? Did you run into any challenges in implementing your course? And we have put the courses, the syllabi in the chat. So participants, please feel free to look at the chat and look at the syllabi. Um, but that would be our first question, sort of the process, the decision to teach it and challenges in implementing it. And Rachel, we'll start with you. Um, the course that I wanted to create was an online course, a fully online, as asynchronous as we could make it as possible um, course. Of course, we're bound by things like the terms of the semester, when assignments were due, but we wanted to create the sense that you could take this course in your own time and at your own speed. And the course is a Holocaust on screen. And what we were looking at was the Holocaust, like cinema of the Holocaust. And it was really important to us that it wasn't the story of the Holocaust as told through film, um, a kind of history course that was, was supplemented by Holocaust films, but rather a story about how filmmakers have engaged in making cinema about the Holocaust. Because what we wanted to get at was um, really at the root of the question is what shape the kinds of films that get made? When do they get made? Who's making them? And, and what does it mean? And there was sort of two guiding principles in how the course would be set up. One is about genre. <clears throat> what does it mean when you make a comedy about the Holocaust? What does it mean when you make um, a musical about the Holocaust? So we really wanted to think about how genre shaped the stories that were being told. And the other thing that we wanted to look at was how the social, political, and historical context in which the films were being made um, really controlled what we were seeing on screen. And one of the ways that we did that was by looking at how um, Holocaust films are made in a number of different countries in different time periods. So that we were able to sort of show changing attitudes, not just in the United States, but we look in, um, at films from Russia and Poland um, and Italy and France. And so we wanted to sort of understand that the narratives that we are being told about history are always being shaped by information that's taking place in the present. And that those were sort of the guiding principles for setting up the course itself. And we thought that there was really a space for taking these Holocaust films and not just sticking them in a literature course as like, oh, and here's the film, but really thinking about film as a genre. And so the problem with film, of course, is you know, if I'm screening a two and a half hour film, or in some cases with Holocaust movies, a four hour film or an eight hour film, um, trying to use a class time to do that is impossible. And so we felt like, um, we felt that doing the online, like a fully online course would offer us tons of opportunities to allow for um, a combination of lectures and films without it being something that was um, sort of problematic in terms of where we were cutting the film, how we were managing people's time, subtitles and everything else. So, so in the end, you know, this is, this is why we chose the format that we did. But of course we ran into a couple of very um, particular problems. The first thing I would say to anyone who's creating an online course, when you're making videos, and this happened right before the pandemic. So now everybody's an expert in online courses, but right before the pandemic, um, if you're creating a real online course, not just taking an in-person course and kind of switching it online, the, there are things that you do like filming lectures in studios and cutting those videos and editing those videos. And you need about two years of planning for a fully online course. It doesn't work the way other kinds of courses do. And it was amazing just how much time because every single lecture needed to be fully written out and then put on an auto prompt and then read. And those kinds of things, you know, I, I, I teach like this, right? Like I'm speaking. Um, but in that kind of formal recorded environment, it, there was a lot more in advance preparation. And I would say that people should be mindful if they're moving to the online version to think about those contexts. Um, the challenge that we ran into, and I think that this is um, certainly something that 
is going to remain an ongoing challenge for people is how do you screen films online? There are online services that you can pay for in thousands and thousands of dollars in order to be able to screen the film, often run through the library service. Um, and those films, they, they, we would charge $2,500 in the first year to have a selection of eight films. It was not financially viable to do that. My department wasn't picking up the cost. My library wasn't picking up the cost. And so we ran into a question, how do, how do you do this? How do you screen the film? Um, and we found a solution that is now working for us that I feel maintains the spirit of the law around copyright, which is that um, it is not illegal. I was thinking about this this morning. It is not illegal for you to buy a film and digitally conserve that film, right, for your own usage. It is not illegal to screen a film to students. The problem arises when you screen the film either in a way that is outside open to a general public or in a way where the student could take the film and put it on YouTube, right? If you can, then you're dealing with a copyright issue. So um, through my university, I have a box, you know, what we were, like a Dropbox service, but it's a university one. So um, but I have a much bigger memory in it than I would have through a Dropbox. You can actually create links in Dropbox that are share that are view only. So you and can only be viewed either by the person who has the code, or you can even restrict it further and pre record who is allowed to access that. We then took those links and embedded them in the online platform. So can I just switch to the online platform for a second to show everyone what it looks like. So this is our online platform. Um, I'm just going to take you back one link um, and show you what a single module for the course would look like. So this is how a single module of the course is presented. This is the very first session before the war. And we're talking about propaganda here. Um, the materials for the course, you're getting the, the faculty viewing end, but um, the materials are all lined up. In here, you have lectures where you're able to click on the lecture um, and you would get your full lecture. But below, I could record, um, and here is a link that's embedded. And that link would take you to my Dropbox so that only the student who already can only get into this service if they're already registered for the course. So the platform itself is closed. The link is only available by clicking on the link itself, which takes you to the film. So I'm just going to show you what that would look like. I'm clicking on the film. And there you are, you're in the film. So that it becomes almost, and then you would just play. So it becomes almost impossible for you to then rip it and pirate it. You would have to have your own specialist software, at which point, you know, <laughs> that's a whole other level of piracy that we were um, sort of trying to avoid. So that's how we sort of worked our way around um, those questions of, um, uh, of technical issues. And I think that for me was the biggest challenge with creating online courses. Um, and I just wanna show you um, just a moment of what these lectures look like. Um, so you sort of start them and um, they're sort of pre-recorded with pretty intros and um, sort of uh, aesthetic, I, what, the aim that I had was to make them look like um, low budget PBS documentaries. And so they intersperse images, um, film clips, sort of narratives, so that there would be pleasure for the student viewing it. And so it wouldn't be this kind of endless voice on screen of the lecturer explaining what was going on. So that's kind of the setup for how the course was created. Thank you. Wow. That, that already you've given us an enormous amount to think about. It's, it's, it's impressive, daunting, but doable also. So, so thank you for the, for, for, for the set of re initial remarks and, and mayor, let me turn, let me turn now to you. Wonderful. So I want to first begin by thanking AEN and Miriam and the others uh, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And I'm going to begin with a course titled Anne and Emmett. Confronting Anti-Semitism, Racism, and Otherness Through Pedagogy. 
And this course was created for education majors. So it's in a college of education, which as you all know, is often not the place one would find a course on anti-Semitism. But I saw an opportunity as my college was focusing on the extremely important work of being anti-racist and pro-black, that I would be able to stand in solidarity with a course on anti-racism, but also introduce the important lens of anti-Semitism, which had not been taught fully in a course here at the University of South Carolina. So I was thrilled um, to have this opportunity. And my overarching question, the overarching question for the course was, what was taught in school that provided society a license to kill two children? So what was taught in school that provided society a license to kill children? And we used Anne Frank, age 13, Emmett Till, age 14, as a microcosms. And I addressed the type of education system that made it possible, but even more important, how education can counter that type of otherness and that type of hatred. So it was based around that. And I set up the course up. So we began with a real conceptual framework of the personal identity of the students. So we did something called the archaeology of the self from Dr. Ruiz, where each student looked into their own personal lives and what biases did they bring with them. And we also looked at societal inequities. So sort of setting the stage in the first uh, couple of weeks of the course. And then we moved into what is anti-Semitism. Now in this Ann and Emmett course, I had no Jewish students. Uh, so when asked what is anti-Semitism, as you all know, the answer was the Holocaust, and that's where it began and it ended. Um, so I had an opportunity to really dive deep, and of course, I gave also time to dive into the different stages of racism through the eras. I had guests from each community come, so scholars and elders from the Jewish community, the African American community, and we did case studies. So we looked at the um, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, so-called racial riots of 1991 and asked the question, what could have schools done the year before those riots, the year after those, inter those riots? What could have happened? And then the, the bulk of the course was looking at curriculum models, pedagogy that can counter these hatreds. And that was culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, something I call good trouble framework, justice pedagogy, um, critical lenses, tenets of critical race theory. So yes, we I taught critical race theory. And I used um, Dr. Rubin's uh, recently published Heed Crit, so a Jewish version of critical race theory. Um, and in my remaining moment, I'll describe challenges. Uh, the challenges really came when I moved from the anonymic course, which was a special topic, to getting this a similar course put on the books that will be available to teach every semester. And that was called African and Jewish American Convergence and Divergence, a look at anti-Semitism and racism. So when the university sort of saw that this was gonna be um, offered in the course catalog for the foreseeable future, uh, there were questions. Um, how was I gonna balance the educational component with history? which is a different college's turf. So I had to be careful to do that balance. Um, the course was jointly listed through African-American studies, Jewish studies, and the College of Education. So there were some budgeting issues and where the student dollars flowed that I um, spent time dealing on. And then the strangest challenge was the last, uh, last hurdle was I was called in by uh, the provost level, the associate provost, and asked, um, was I an expert to teach this material? Um, I wasn't a historian, I wasn't a sociologist, I'm not a full anti-Semitic uh, scholar, uh, so who are you? So I said, well, let's not focus on who I'm not, let's focus on who I am. And uh, eventually that calmed down and, and this course now is listed and can be taught every semester. So that's a brief overview of, of how this came to be in a college of education. Thank you for sharing um, really innovative course and, and some of those challenges um, that maybe, you know, we wouldn't face with another type of course um, uh, at the provost coming in and asking 
your class and your credentials. Um, James, please go ahead. Okay. First of all, thank you very much to Miriam and to the rest of the AEN team for the gracious invitation. Uh, my I am a scholar of 16th and 17th century Spanish literature, as Rafa um, mentioned. And my course was entitled the, Concept, the, the Concepts of Race in Early Modern Spain. It was designed as a senior seminar course, 400 level course for undergraduates at Kalamazoo College, for, specifically for Spanish majors. Most of them had come back from study abroad, although it was also offered virtually during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is all a virtual course done both synchronously and asynchronously. In terms of the course development, uh, the, the course was initially developed because I noticed over the course of, of the pandemic and, of course, uh, and over the course of the various kinds of, um, of protests that were going on in Kenosha and in Minneapolis, that there was an ignorance regarding anti-Semitism, particularly in social media and largely among college age students and above. So it was, it was both a generational gap and a knowledge gap. And I felt that my expertise in Judaism could help shed a light as it were on helping students understand the anti-Semitic tropes that they are seeing in social media every single day on various feeds, Instagram, Twitter, whichever. Um, and then I also related this to the larger goal of, of anti-racism discussions on, on, at Kalamazoo College campus. And I also took advantage of, of a interesting historical detail that the word raza in Spanish, in 16th century Spanish, was used to describe anti-Semitism. So I related the notion of anti-racism and anti-Semitism as a conceptual framework to discuss, to have students identify and contextualize different anti-Semitic and Islamophobic tropes in 16th and 17th century Spanish literature. That would be in drama, in poetry, in um, chronicles, in painting, I really try to give a diverse set of cultural artifacts from both Spain and the New World. So the focus of class discussion was on, again, identifying and contextualizing tropes that they would then engage with in a different way in their final projects. So the assignments were that they had to determine to what degree Judaism or anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism was indeed a modern example or, or a precursor to modern racism, because there's a historiographical debate about that within Spanish history, and I wanted them to truly understand the relationships between racism and anti-Semitism. But moreover, as a final project, the students developed not only a 10 to 12 page collaborative research paper where they chose a trope studied in the course and then and then explored or, or researched the reappearance of that trope in 20 and 21st century Spanish and American US political discourse. So they explain, so they, um, they identified a trope, they wrote a paper and then they developed what I called an augmented reality poster that used a app called Post Reality that allowed students to incorporate social media feeds, images, and develop videos that captioned the imagery that they were um, that they were researching. So, like for example, there was a there was a, a a project analyzing the trope of greed in Francisco Quevedo's picaresque novels and Borat, or the uh, Again, the trope of the coronavirus in a medical treatise of the 16th century and in political discourses surrounding the coronavirus. Um, so they learned the transferable skills of video production, of doing this all in Spanish, which they hadn't done before, and also engaging with, so, with the social media feeds, their own social media feeds. 
And in terms of challenges, and then I'll pass it back to the moderator. Um, the major challenge for me was getting them to realize that anti-Semitism is a form of racism. And I, and I scaffolded throughout the quarter a series of paper conferences, group discussions that allowed them to reflect on the kinds of imagery that they were seeing. Um, and then at the end of the at the end of the course, I organized a virtual exhibition where they displayed their augmented reality posters to the entire campus community. And overall, they, they, the students felt that they said that it was the most intersectional course they'd ever taken and they were quite surprised that it was coming from the Spanish department. Um, and, uh, and then again, they learned transferable skills and gained confidence in using a second language, which is part of our institutional learning outcomes in the Spanish department. And with that, I can pass it back to Miriam. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for just sharing your interest in developing this kind of a course uh, and then grounding it in your discipline, but making it relevant to the students for today and um, just this process of, of what you had them do, just fascinating. Thank you. Um, Avi, please. Thank you so much, Miriam, and uh, thank you to Miriam and Rafa and the AEN for organizing today's program. It's so nice to see everyone. And also for, for me, as I'm going through this process of developing a class to learn from everybody else. So uh, thank you so much for putting this together. So one of the things that I find really interesting already from this discussion is the many different contexts within which we're functioning and the different types of classes that we're trying to design across disciplines, across schools, across different colleges, it's it's already a really interesting um, sort of challenge to think about. So um, I will share a little bit of my experience here at the University of Connecticut just by way of introduction. I, as Rafa mentioned, I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies at, at UConn and my training is in modern Jewish history. Um, most of my research and writing focuses on Jewish responses to the Holocaust. So in my own teaching, I deal with uh, the topic of anti-Semitism quite extensively in, in classes on modern Jewish history, on Jewish responses to the Holocaust, on the history of Zionism, the state of Israel, and American Jewish history, Jewish literature, and also Jewish humor, which um, we can perhaps talk about later, which in some ways of all of those classes, I have found to be the best class with which to engage with the question of how to respond to anti-Semitism. Um, and, and maybe we'll, we'll have time to address that. But, this class and actually the, the um, syllabus that was shared in the chat is actually a new challenge um, in terms of developing a course on anti-Semitism that in some ways um, uh, resonates with uh, part of what Rachel talked about in terms of the challenge of developing an online asynchronous class that is actually a completely new class on the topic of anti-Semitism. And for that, I'll just provide a little bit of context as to why sort of I've been asked to develop this class, which is supposed to launch in the spring of 2022. So March of 2022, uh, this class is going to launch. So um, here at UConn, uh, as I'm sure many other campuses had over the past year, we had a number of um, anti-Semitic incidents which took place on campus, probably one or two students um, sort of up to no good um, that uh, generated a lot of, of um, sort of high profile coverage of swastikas being uh, painted at various uh, sites on campus and um, incidents that took place in student dorms that um, obviously uh, made many of our students feel threatened and persecuted and very uncomfortable. Um, at, the same, at the same time, the students circulated a petition to the administration to say we want to have teaching um, that will teach people about the dangers of anti-Semitism and respond to this issue. And within this context, there had already been a format that was developed at UConn over 2020 of a new format of what are we are calling pop-up classes, pop-up uh, free online asynchronous classes that are offered for one credit that respond to contemporary issues. So just in the last year in 2020, we've had new pop-up classes on uh, COVID-19 on um, anti-Black racism and on the climate uh, crisis and climate change. 
And so we have a new format in place for uh, basically seven week um, uh, focus on specific topics that is supposed to be an online asynchronous class. And they, after the students circulated a petition saying we'd like to have a class on anti-Semitism, um, I got a call from the provost and who asked, uh, would you be willing to uh, organize such a class? And of course, uh, what do you say to such a call? But yes, please sign me up, I will do it. Um, so uh, that initiated this process. Now, what's been interesting is, as I mentioned before, um, we already have many classes in Judaic studies that deal with the topic of anti-Semitism or the history of anti-Judaism in one way or another. And this is covered in classes that go all the way from uh, antiquity, ancient Jewish history, the rabbinic period, the medieval, early modern period, as I noted, classes that deal with modern Jewish history, and even a class which I think was shared in the chat, which my colleague Arnie Dashevsky developed on the sociology of anti-Semitism. Um, and some of my colleagues said right away, well, look, why don't we just encourage these the students to take our existing classes? And for those of us who are um, know the challenges of trying to get students to either major or minor in Judaic studies, um, you know, it, it makes sense, right, to say, well, just take some of our classes that already exist. But we're responding to a very specific moment in time and a very specific and urgent need. And so we said, no, we have to develop this new class that is a seven week um, sort of uh, response to the challenge of anti Semitism, but teaching about it. And so, in terms of the challenges, one has been how to design a class like this that is supposed to use new technology, new modalities, um, encouraging and convincing my faculty that they have what to add and contribute to this, while also, as Rachel can probably attest to with this online asynchronous, the uh, experts on campus in sort of the teaching, the way to teach it like this, say, well, you can't record 45 minute lectures um, on the topic. Uh, student attention spans last about eight to 10 minutes. So record uh, you know, a, a seven minute intro and then provide all sorts of resources. So it's a, it's a real challenge to figure out A, how to do it, also how to cover a topic as huge as anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. And I'll say one of the, the primary challenges that I've been concerned with was if we have, let's say a thousand students, it's a large state school and we might have a thousand students sign up for a free one credit class that you know will be easy to pass. Um, if this is the only class that they're going to take where they are introduced to the topic of Jewish history, um, we don't want them to just uh, be learning about who are Jews and what is Judaism and Jewish history through the lens of anti-Semitism. So um, what we've tried to do is design a class where the first thing that we do is talk about who are the Jews and what, what, is, uh, what is Jewish history, and also use it as a way to introduce students, frankly, to all of what I think we have our wonderful faculty experts on all these periods of Jewish history. Um, and not to frame Jewish history through the lens of anti-Semitism. Yes, it's important for us to learn about how Jews have responded to persecution throughout history, but also, you know, to, uh, the words of Salah Baron echoing that it's not sort of a um, history of, of uh, a lacrimose history of, uh, of Jewish woe, right? So to sort of balance that out. And so the class itself um, is, is called Why the Jews? Jewish Responses to Anti-Semitism. The why the Jews actually comes from a punchline of a joke about the Jews and the bicycle riders, which I won't tell now because I've already given away the punchline. Um, and it, it attempts to sort of balance this history of anti-Semitism with an overarching view of Jewish history while compressing it into seven weeks with these very short eight minute intros and then all the links. So it's, it's a real challenge, but um, it's, uh, and I will say the last thing I'll say is probably the number one challenge is trying to get 12 to 15 faculty experts uh, organized around designing a course together. It would be much easier if I just did this by myself, but um, that's that's a big, a big challenge, but it's working. Thanks so much, Avid, and talking about both the technical issues that had to be overcome and, and also these conceptual elements and being really thoughtful about a very ambitious project for the campus. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to, to Rafa for, for the next question. 
Great. So um, I wanted to ask um, how you all represent um, a, a, a wide range of academic uh, disciplines. So I wanted to know how did you adapt your course content, whether those are readings, lectures, assignments, et cetera, to your specific academic discipline? Uh, I, I'm sorry, and we'll start with Meyer this time. All right, well, thank you for that question, Rafa. So I um, will talk mostly about assignments. My readings were a mixture of people that you'd expect, Deborah Lipstadt, Mark Dollinger, um, some of the classics like the conversation between uh, Lerner and West, um, and also pedagogical pieces. So I'm, I was constantly balancing to increase the student's knowledge of anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism along with pedagogy. So the reading assignments uh, would include both each week. And this course, uh, the anonymic course was taught on Zoom, uh, a live course, synchronous course. And actually this semester with the convergence and divergence course, uh, my university went back to face-to-face. -to -face. So both of these uh, were taught. Um, I didn't have the challenges of my colleagues because I was teaching on real time. Uh, so the assignments in this course were changed. And, and I want to mention one lovely thing about the College of Education and here at the University of South Carolina is there is solidarity between those teaching um, anti-Black racism courses, myself as the only Jewish representative in my department looking at anti-Semitism. So we do have each other's back. So in the culturally relevant pedagogy classes, Judaism, anti-Semitism is a component. Um, so that's a, a really nice thing to be in, in with the colleagues that do that work um, and don't exclude that work. So my assignments dealt with something called the critical school memoir. And I touched briefly on this, but that would be looking at where the students felt that their either Judaism or race was highlighted in their school experiences. And we're looking at elementary school, middle school, a few high school. So where did they see Judaism? Where did they see race in the courses? Where was it absent, omitted? Um, how were they marginalized? or if they were Christian, which were most of my students are white Christian students. So how do they see other identities? So that was an assignment that asked them to dig deep into the personal and they did an excellent job with it. And they also had an interview assignment where they needed to interview six to seven students that were not in our course. And they each came up with 20 questions on anti-Semitism and on racism. And they really needed to do um, sem what we called semi-clinical interviews. So they'd ask a, a pre-formed question, but follow it up with a question to get more information from their participant. And they did well with those. They were um, learning about people's thinking and attitudes on anti-Semitism, thinking and attitudes on racism. And they created a five to eight page paper, which began to sort of crystallize how what they learned from the participants and what did it mean for them as educators so it wasn't only oh we we found that people didn't know much about judaism outside of the holocaust as as was mentioned that um you know we i wanted them to understand there was a three thousand year rich history prior to that there's a history after that so they were able to understand the lack of that appreciation and then discuss how they would change it in their own teaching, whether if they were in school already or if they were pre-service teachers, what might they add to their classrooms, to their teaching materials, uh, to their curricula that would shine a light on Jewish history, culture, language, and so on and so forth. And the fine or and another project which was in the midst of those two was called a field study, where they actually had to go and um, meet or. Uh, virtually meet people who ran Jewish businesses or spend at least an hour on a Jewish museum's website. So they were able to talk to people, uh, surprisingly, almost all, or not surprising, almost all of them, at least for one person, keyed in on food. So Jewish food was very popular. <laughs> 
<laughs> they spoke to restaurant owners. I'm just trying to understand what kosher was and what the market is. Uh, but these assignments, the field study and um, the interview assignment and the critical school memoir really allowed them to look deeply in themselves and make actual changes to their teaching methods. So I, I was pretty happy with the assignments for the course. Hey, thank you so much. It seems like this was a really great combination of 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 personal and also academic engagement and 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 uh, and involvement, especially the the in person uh, components of, of of the course. So that that sounds really fascinating and fun too. Um, so James, um, on to you. Thank thank you very much, Rafa. Um, to answer your question about how do I adapt this to. Uh, uh, okay, so to how to adapt the course to the specific disciplinary goals, the main disciplinary goals of the senior seminar in our department was the continuation of their cultural, intercultural knowledge regarding Spanish culture and American culture, also and a continuation of their acquisition of, of the Spanish language in a variety of different contexts. And then also a third one is just generally how to close read a difficult text that is intellectually challenging and having them identify a problem that or a inconsistency in that text. So how did how did I adapt this to how did I adapt anti the engagement of anti-Semitism to to literary studies goals? Through, largely through scaffolding. As I mentioned, um, uh, I had them do a, an, a recorded oral presentation. And they, they were assigned to a group at the very beginning of the quarter. And then throughout the quarter, they engaged in three separate projects that, that helped them understand and engage with anti-Semitism. One was an, an exploration of the, of the, of the problem of of anti-Semitism as racism, and they they summarized a secondary source that helped them define a trope, and then they applied that secondary source to one of the texts we studied in class, and then they did a secondary collaborative project where they then said, "Okay, we under taking this trope as our point of departure. We're going to see how this trope is then." reutilized or reconfigured in 21st century Spanish and US um, American discourse. How, and in fulfilling these goals in class, um, similar to my colleagues, I prepared video lectures of eight to 10 minutes that went into the historical context of each unit of, of uh, biography about the author, um, Jewish history, um, and then proposed a series of discussion questions so that they had a bank of discussion questions to go off of for, for class discussion. Then I used a tool called Hypothesis that allowed them to add their own discussion questions so I could see where, where they, how they were engaging with the text. And so that mixture of questions, answers, observations led us to very productive discussions in groups where I would where I would have them focus on particular passages and truly unpack what is the what is the text saying, i.e., because it's in a, it's in a, it's in sixteenth and seventeenth century Spanish. So there's always a linguistic element to this. So what's the text saying? What is the text doing? And how does it help us understand Jewish literary history and Jew, um, and and in so doing, they practice close reading or a, a kind of close reading. The, the course itself was em emphasized for the most part primary sources. Each unit had a series of secondary sources. I used a mixture of history of ideas, approaches, and transnational approaches, uh, largely scholars from Spain to give them the, to show them the difference between how Spain tackles this question versus how the US tackles this question. So that was a discussion that I had them engage with in their groups. But, um, and then a tertiary goal was 
constant collaboration, moments of collaboration, because they were yearning for community in a virtual course. So throughout the course, they were meeting outside of class, meeting with me, um, constantly in groups, going over different passages, asking each other questions, um, listening to each other's presentations, commenting on each other's presentations um, in a variety of different formats. So I really tried to give them multiple points of entry and multiple levels of engagement by, through the scaffolding of the different assignments. Thank you, James. Um, it seems like this was a really remarkable combination of, of literary analysis and historical analysis and, and, and in-person um, student collaboration. So uh, that's, that sounds fascinating. Um, so Avi, over to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you, James, also. You know, you, you said something in your initial remarks about your student, your students' responses to this class being sort of the most intersectional class that they've experienced. And that really resonated with me because I think one of the, one of the things that often ends up happening, um, at least in my experiences in Judaic studies classes, is that they are completely interdisciplinary, right? That, um, you know, Judaic studies really is a discipline that uh, you have historians and you have uh, literature scholars and you have scholars of religion and politics and you name it sort of coming together in this field. So that that does often happen. And I, I agree with you that it's something that really um, sort of uh, rings true for students. So in this um, class that, uh, that, that we're designing, um, one of the interesting things is that this sort of uh, interdisciplinary nature uh, is playing itself out in the way that the class is, is being designed. So um, as I mentioned, there are, are about 12 to 15 different um, sort of faculty collaborators in the design of this class who are uh, teaching at different uh, segments of the semester or different segments of the seven week class uh, when it fits into their expertise and in their time period and sort of doing it collaboratively. So what that means is that we have um, scholars from Judaic studies, but also from history, uh, from uh, my larger department, which is called Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, so uh, literary scholars, um, philosophy, Judaic studies, poli-sci, anthropology, religion, sociology, right? There's, it is completely interdisciplinary, which makes it it just extremely fascinating to think about the different ways in which uh, people from different um, sort of training and disciplines approach this problem, both of the problem of anti-Semitism, but also the problem of how to teach about anti-Semitism. Now, I will acknowledge my training is in Hebrew and Judaic studies and in history. I, that's how I was trained at NYU where I got my PhD. And so I think about these things very historically. And the way that I've organized the class is you know, basically from antiquity to the present. But what's been interesting about designing the class is that, um, you know, I think the students also want to try to understand the contemporary, uh, not just contemporary relevance, but they want to see the through lines that draw all the way back from antiquity to the present. And so what we're doing in the way that the class is designed is that in addition to those short eight to 10 minute intro videos at the beginning, short readings, supposed to be very short readings, links, articles, nothing overly sort of um, academic in terms of the amount that we're expecting them to, to read, is we also each week have what's called an artifact. So it might be a, um, an image, uh, a photo, a text that we will analyze together and sort of follow it throughout history from the period of time that we're talking about all the way uh, to the present. So there are all sorts of symbols when we're teaching about anti-Semitism or tropes as, as James and Mayer alluded to or stereotypes that we can sort of follow their lineage um, throughout history. So for example, um, when uh, my colleagues, uh, Stuart and Sarah are gonna be talking about sort of the ancient period and um, anti-Judaism and early Christianity, uh, the topic of, you know, passion plays might come up and we might learn about the passion both from the gospels, but we can follow the passion all the way from the gospels to Gibson, right? And kind of look at those through lines. And I think it'll be very interesting for students to think about it, not just from the 21st century or late 20th century perspective, but to go all the way back and see where these things come from or the blood libel, you know, is another example. So 
we can look at it and you know we might learn about sort of the medieval origins or we might learn about one of my uh, colleagues Suzanne Einbinder is an expert on the medieval period might talk about in this time period but we'll also follow you know follow it all the way through to QAnon right and sort of see like where these stereotypes and these tropes come back from historically and what's been drawn upon in the in the present day um, you referenced the trope of greed and Borat, and I'm just sort of, you know, thinking about Sasha Baron Cohen, which, you know, we, we'll talk about in that class, like, what is that an effective response or not, but also to have the students think about sort of the image of the, the court Jew, the Rothschilds, George Soros, um, you know, and the protocols of the elders of Zion. And I think they're going to see all kinds of things that they'll say, oh, right, I can see that historically but I can also see how these symbols, these images, these tropes carry through all the way to the present day and be able to identify it in ways that they may not have seen before. So um, that's you know one of the things that's important to us and in, in not only doing this in an interdisciplinary way, but is also so that students realize that we're not just talking about the year 2020 or 2021, right? That we're gonna see sort of these patterns repeat in different periods of history and I want them to think about also the strategies that Jews have used to respond to these patterns um, historically, what has been effective, what has not been effective. And hopefully we can learn at the end of the class like strategies that we can apply in the present day. So I'll stop myself there, thanks. Thank you, Avi. Um, it's very fascinating to learn how um, your use of images would um, help, uh, images and other artifacts would help uh, students learn about the, the historical resonances of anti-Semitic uh, tropes and stereotypes. So thank you. Um, now over to Rachel. So um, working on a film course is really interesting because we watch TV all the time, we watch film all the time, and we think we know what we're seeing on the screen. And one of the things that we really wanted to focus on in this course is taking apart what we already accept as um, sort of received images and really interrogating them. And so one of the things that I included in the course were um, links to um, these online videos, which are amazing, which teach you about film language. What we wanted to get away from was a na the narrative, right? What did the guy say in the, sh the film, right? What was the plot? And we wanted to start thinking beyond that. What, what else are you seeing on screen? Where are people standing? Where, how is power being displayed? Um, think about where the camera is. You know, if we shoot up, someone looks like a hero. If we shoot down, someone looks small and they're made um, to um, be dehumanized. And so, um, so I started by introducing these films, these, um, these sort of film language um, videos, which really talk about, you know, what is a shot? How are these different shots crafted? How are scenes put together? What happens when we have these things? What do they tell us? And so it, it sort of disassembled um, the film text for students because they started to think about what are you seeing in that moment on the screen? And it allowed us to pause and then really take apart what was happening. You know, what happens when you see someone at eye level versus if they're at a different height from you? What happens in the background? What happens with the music? What happens if you watch something with no sound at all? How much information do you get? And so um, it was really important to sort of deconstruct those things. And one of the most interesting things that happened was I screened Night in the Garden which is a seven minute short film that you can find online. It was a reassembly of historical archive material that people found um, recording a Nazi, essentially a Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden. Um, really available, you can see it. Um, it's very weird because you have, you know, your kind of Nazi banners hanging next to your American flag. And the students watched the film and their, their takeaway from it was because they're now looking at the visual codes, not just the narrative, they started to recognize other patterns and displays of fascism taking place at the same time as they were watching this. And one of them said, oh my God, this looks exactly like a Trump rally. You know, it looks like they've taken this person out, they've grabbed this person, that's exactly like that Trump rally that I just watched. And it was really interesting having them start to draw connections, you know, seeing parades of 
um, kind of Nazis go essentially in a, you know, um, like Beauty and the Beast, right? Let's go kill the beast, that kind of um, marauding team. And then seeing the Charleston, um, not the Charleston, the, um, oh. Charlottesville. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to get there. The show, I, I'm like, I had to see it at the age I was getting there, but the, seeing the Charlottesville rally, like the students themselves were drawing those connections as we were teaching the course. And I thought that that was an amazing thing that they were starting to do, which was see those links and, and be able to recognize those displays of fascism um, around them in real ways, right? They weren't, they weren't kind of extrapolating in ridiculous ways, um, but they were really saying, oh my God, I see these patterns oh, I saw this flag, it had the red and the black. I now know what they're trying to evoke. You don't need the whole um, symbol. You can take metonyms of a single you know, symbolic representation, reapply it, and the whole thing is instantly evoked. And, and being able to really take apart what we see as visual aid was one of the goals of the course and was something that the students really picked up on very quickly. Thank you, Rachel. It seems like this focus on the, the visual and, 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 and technical and aesthetic aspects of the films really helped the, the students' cultural and historical and political analyses. So that, that, that sounds very fascinating. So I'm going to turn it over back to Miriam um, for, the final, um, for the final question. I, I really want to be a student again and take all these courses. Uh, they're just they're just outstanding. What a terrific job you're all doing for your students um, and for your campus. And, and, and that's really the last question. And, and please feel free, uh, those in the audience, to, to um, you know, add your, your comments or your questions. We may not be able to get to every question, but we will be saving the chat. Um, and so you know, we'll be able to connect you with, with our various speakers afterwards if we can't get to all the, the comments or the questions. But our, our third question for all the panelists, just to end up, uh, was sort of to move beyond the course and to ask you not only the impact um, on the students taking the classes, uh, which is profound, uh, but, but what your sense is about how these courses are mattering on the campus at large. So, you know, in your department or with colleagues, um, with other students or the, you know, how, how they're, impacting the overall campus climate and environment. So if you could each speak to that um, for a few minutes before we open it up and I will I'll start with James. Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, th so thinking broadly, so yes, the, as I mentioned, the students had an eye-opening experience in relation to seeing the relationships between anti-Semitism and anti-racism on the one hand. And then uh, they, they commented to me about how they, a lot of the discussions would continue in different social settings. They didn't necessarily explain, explain those conversations in exquisite detail, but that it provoked a lot of conversation. Um, I do know that they were very proud to um, share their work um, and very open to sharing their work to, to the wider campus community um, and really saw the value of their, of their effort. Uh, they most, I wouldn't say that, I think I had a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish students um, and it was interesting what made certain students uncomfortable and what what and what their level of discomfort was because when I proposed that they do a public or semi-public exhibition to spread the word about their projects but also to in, enlighten the camp or in, in essence change the campus climate and, and engage in debate their first reaction was they need to be experts in anti-semitism or they won't understand it and I'll be canceled by my colleagues. So I, in, in terms, so there was that hesitancy always to engage beyond the, the, their quote unquote safe space of the class. Um, now, if 
If there were experts in anti-Semitism there, fellow faculty members, for example, they engaged beautifully and they felt more comfortable. But in terms of student to student contact, I tried to get, I tried to invite fellow majors, I tried to invite other students, but the consensus among the students was that they were too afraid to, to share their, their work without proper contextualization. And I gave a, a 20 minute uh, lecture, essentially contextualizing the course for the, for the campus community in light of that concern. But that was the efforts that were made to, to increase campus climate, both departmentally and university wide. Thank you so much. I, I, I like how you talked about the impromptu, informal, but sort of private conversations that um, were generated uh, from the course among the students. And then the issues of having them present publicly on these topics um, uh, and I, you know, how, how you uh, help the students to navigate that. Um, so thank you so much for, 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 for sharing that. Um, um, and Avi, please. Thank you, thank you, Miriam. So uh, I think in terms of, you know, the impact that, that the class, um, I guess is going to have on the students and the one, the specific class that I've been talking about, it's it's hard to know um, right now. I mean, I, I will say that I do have this feeling, and we'll see if this plays itself out. That um, it may not be the exactly the class the students who were uh, circulating the petition asking for a class on anti-Semitism expected. Um, that is, that we're uh, academics, and uh, so what we often end up doing is spending time, as you'll see in the syllabus that I shared. Um, you know, haggling over definitions and what is and what is not, and uh, you know, uh, what's the difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, and you know, we'll, we'll spend some time on that, and um, you know, can we trace it all the way back through history? Well, if not, how do we distinguish between you know what we determine as to be anti-Judaism in the pre-modern period and modern forms of anti-Semitism? I mean. I think on some level, there's gonna be some component of like, okay, when are you gonna to get to the current day, present day stuff, which is why we do wanna sort of draw those through lines all the way through. Um, I will say that our last session of the class, uh, the way that we're designing it is to bring in some um, resources from colleagues at the ADL in particular. Um, and we have a recent alum who graduated from the University of Connecticut in 2014 or 15, who um, was also a human rights major and who now works at the ADL Center for Extremism. And um, we're really interested in, her name's Emily Kaufman and she's gonna come talk to the students. And we're really interested in having her come talk, first of all, because this is someone who just graduated a few years ago and who is very much sort of on the front lines of confronting the type of um, sort of toxic stew that we're seeing online. and following these hate groups online and can very much sort of talk to students about how the ADL can provide the types of resources that, that they wanna know how do we respond to, you know, when we see it before our very eyes here on campus. So it's very important for us to provide that as a resource. At the same time as academics, we're sort of sensitive to, that's not our expertise, right? Like we can go back and trace it through history and talk to you about, um, you know, the way in which it's evolved, but it, you know, it may not be exactly what they're asking for. So we also want to provide those those resources. And I'll say that um, I, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we, we are working very closely with our colleagues at Hillel, um, who in many ways are more on the front lines of helping students try to deal with campus climate issues on the everyday level. And um, our students, you know, I think they feel it, it's it makes them you know, feel more comfortable when they can be in a Judaic studies class and have these topics discussed and know they can talk about it openly. And for some of them talk about identity issues more openly, but many of them don't feel safe. Um, I think this is across the board, you know, about like expressing their identity or expressing sort of uh, wearing a shirt that might have Hebrew lettering on it or sort of expressing, you know, pro-Israel sentiments. Like there's, and I think, so this is something where we have to address how do we have our students, and which is, I think, exactly why we're here, feel um, more, more comfortable um, expressing this component of their identity or not feeling threatened 
for having that as a component of their identity. And, um, you know, we'll see in terms of the, the, the student responses um, to, to the class itself. Thanks, Avi. I, I um, like how you sort of shared that, that aspect of what the academic study is all about and what academics will do in this course may not be exactly what students might want um, or expect uh, in enrolling. Uh, and then how you tried to provide a little bit of something for everybody um, and, and like how you, you mentioned bringing in um, some other stakeholders, um, whether it's alumni or Hillel or other organizations um, that can also enrich a class that um, would be very academically heavy, but it brings uh, other perspectives. So thank you. Um, and Rachel, please. To sort of follow on from some of the things that Avi was talking about, like how do you bring it into the present and how do you think about it in those contexts? And one of the things that I do at the end of the course is the final module really looks at how the Holocaust is essentially among us today. And we do that in two different ways. We look at women in gold and we talk about, you know, art restoration, the fact that many of these claims still aren't being dealt with. Um, we talk about the recent discovery of. Um, a Swiss um, a collector's like enormous um, archive of art in his home and, and, and how even there the restitution and the restoration of art is still woefully under um, managed. And we also um, screen denial and we talk about um, how Holocaust denial is ongoing in our society and what that means and what its place is um, in the conversations that we're having um, and what it means to erase the Holocaust. And so that those conversations really engage with some of those um, sort of bigger questions about how, why this is really relevant today, why this is still ongoing. The other thing that we do is we sort of look at contemporary engagement with Israel. And even in the middle of the course, um, I screen a lot of films that happened in the late 60s, um, things like Exodus, and one of the thing, one of the assignments that the students have is they're asked to write an op-ed from the period, any for any magazine, any publication they like, and they have to answer a question: What should we do with the Jews? And you know, there's all kinds of creative responses that they give, but in the process, they're having to think about like where was this narrative? Why is why does Israel exist, and how was it understood by the world? Um, and, and I get like great answers. I think my favorite was uh, someone who wrote in the style of Time magazine. And um, he, had, he had sort of set up an entire alternative reality where he was like, we should just create a Jewish country in Guantanamo. There's nobody there. It'll be great. Then they're out of the way and we can have oil and we won't upset our Arab neighbors. Like, you know, he'd really thought about all of these political and social questions that go into why we make the decisions we make as the world, not just as, as a country or as Jews. And so that sort of leads through to a, a final film that we screen called um, Jews and Germans, or is, yeah, Jews and Germans, where uh, multiple generations, uh, sort of current generations of Jews and Germans meet together to talk about previous generations relationships and how they were raised and what those tensions mean in their lives. Um, and it's happening in Berlin, where we now have this huge um, Israeli expat community. And so it's really sort of bringing some of those present conversations and showing that they aren't existing in a vacuum. They're part of a long tradition um, of other kinds of conversations that have been taking place and what those mean. And I think that's been a, a kind of really significant sort of way of engaging students in how they think about kind of current situations. Um, and I think someone asked a question which, which I'd like to answer here. I'm getting 100 students a semester for this course, which is unheard of in comparative literature. I think our largest intro class has about 46. And our next largest class has 18. But in the faculty meeting I was just in, they were like, but we think we could get it up to 25. You know, there's this sense of like, there's huge interest in this. There's interest because it's a film course. There's interest because it's an eight week course. And there's interest because there's gen ed. But if I had 200 slots, I would have 200 students enrolled. And there's just no sense that there isn't an appetite for learning about this kind of material. And I think that that's something we really want to highlight that 
you know, our impediment is we don't have more graders because um, I'm not grading 200 papers a semester. Um, and so, you know, if, if we had those kinds of resources, we would have more of these classes. And there's an absolute interest in this stuff. Thank you, Rachel. I think we have to put you in touch with Avi, figure out how to make this a campus-wide course. I mean, it's, it's popular because it fills requirements and things. It's also popular because of the thoughtfulness you've put into it, um, which you've shared with us today. And, and, and in the answer to this question and the way that students can really grapple with current events, current questions, current concerns that they have through the film and the material and get better purchase uh, for themselves in their day-to-day -day lives. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think um, I wanna turn to Mayor who, who will end up this question and then um, we're already getting some good, good comments and questions in the chat. And so we'll open it up uh, uh, after Mayor, but go ahead, please. All right, wonderful, thank you so much. So I'll look at, the, at this question of impact on two, two levels. One, I'll um, play off of James's comment um, about conversations. So I do have students who, or one of our classes right before Thanksgiving was, what are you gonna say around the Thanksgiving table if you're celebrating that holiday? What from this course on anti-Semitism, on anti-Black racism, are you gonna share? What questions are gonna come back to you? do you assume and how will you answer those? So the students by and large felt really secure in communicating the knowledge to others. So I was really happy with that. I'm gonna share um, two of the students end of the semester comments in the chat. So you, you could see those, um, but the students left those in the education course Anne and Emmett left feeling that this will impact their actual teaching. And the students in the convergence and divergence of the African-American and Jewish American communities um, responded that it changed them as people. And one example of that is um, taking off of Rachel just mentioning denial. Uh, Monday night was my last class of this convergence and divergence course. And we had the opportunity of, lo of walking um, from our classroom to our state house where Chabad was putting on a menorah lighting that featured Deborah Lipstadt as speaker. So it was, you know, I couldn't have ended the course better. So they got to hear uh, Deborah Lipstadt present alongside our African-American mayor of, of our city. And that convergence and divergence was, was right there for them, mostly convergence in that case. But I was very impressed that one of the students told me that she wore her Mugging David necklace, her Star of David necklace, because she didn't want to pass. She wanted everyone to know that she was Jewish. And I really feel that there was an impact to the individual student and there was an impact to campus life. The university has publicized this course, has spotlighted it in, in different ways, uh, these two courses. And really, I'm building on that solidarity of here in my university, where there really is very little anti-Israel conversation. So I'm, I'm in a very conservative, uh, politically conservative um, state in a very politically conservative community um, at a university. But still, we don't really have the issues that others might be facing. But I was really happy to see that um, the Hillel folks, the Chabad folks on campus were all joined with this and the larger community rallied around this course and found the value in the university teaching its first course on anti-Semitism. Uh, so I'll stop here because I know we want to have at least 15 minutes for the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really... Um, uh, heartening to see how much support you've had for the classes uh, on the campus. Uh, I am curious whether everybody's felt that they've had that kind of support um, uh, or, you know, whether it's been a little bit more of a challenge to be able to teach it or to get it regularized. But um, there are some questions in the chat. Some have already been answered. Thank you, panelists, for putting in some, some answers. Um, but one question that I just spotted was the relationship between Jewish and non-Jewish students in the classroom. Um, I think that's a that's an important uh, uh, question. I wonder if anybody wants to take that on. What have been your experiences about 
diversity of the student body in, in that are enrolled in the course and the kinds of conversations that are emerging there. Oh. I can take it if that if, if my colleagues want me to. Um, there was a good mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish students. And I taught two sections of the senior seminar to, so I'm responding to both questions. They were about one one section had eleven students, the other section had twenty. Um, the uh, the one one was taught at eight fifteen in the morning, the other was taught at noon. And that is a big difference when it comes to student engagement. Uh, the 815, <laughs> as a matter of fact, was more engaged than the one at 1155, uh, which surprised me. But um, there was a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish students. And, and two, they either, the Jewish students either took great pride in having their history be highlighted in the course, or they, I remember a Jewish student coming up to me after the course saying, I did not know anything about my own history. Thank you for, for teaching me about my own history. And it was a very eye-opening experience for me that gave me a lot of stuff to think about. Um, and then for the non-Jewish students, it, they, I try to, I tried to keep my, my role as professor to be moderator instead of inserting my own fact that I'm a Jewish male, a cisgender male in, into, the, into the conversation because I didn't find it relevant. But they sort of got it out of me <laughs> over the course of the quarter. And I think that they appreciated that, at, that aspect. I gave them the space at least to talk. There were certain moments in the class where especially in the larger group where there were, where, where non-Jewish students were called out for not listening well enough. And then there, there were a few awkward moments and I tried to say, okay, what does effective listening mean? And that's where I went into, I gave a religious example of the Shema, but and then they found out that I was Jewish that way. But um, so I, tr I tried to, to gear to steer the conversation in a certain way, but other in other moments, I just said, "Okay, guys, I turned off my camera and let them talk." So it's just about balance, giving them that balancing act of allowing both voices to be heard and justified, and that was a feeling out process for the larger section. Much easier for the for the smaller section, largely because the students had already come back from Spain in a study abroad experience, so they knew each other. I was a new person in the, in the classroom. The community had already been previously built over the course of many courses, so that helped. Um, and I hope that that answered the question. I'm happy to elaborate, but I'll send it back to Miriam. Yeah. Um, Miriam, can I jump in for a absolutely, second? On this, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'll just say that one of the one of the interesting things that I've found, um, especially at, at UConn, but also when I was at the University of Hartford before so, is that um, you know people ask me, or how many of your students are are Jewish, right? In, in Judaic studies classes, and I'll, I'll say I have no idea because um, what what I've found more and more so is it's really hard to know, right? Like you'll have students who will self-identify and say, yes, I was raised this way and I went to this Jewish school and I have this background. And then, you know, as, as James pointed out, sometimes you have to disabuse, disabuse them of all sorts of, you know, notions that they haven't really learned very much about Jewish history or Jewish culture in, in an accurate way. Um, and then I have a lot of students who may have one Jewish parent, which I think more and more so sort of um, captures a large portion of the students who um, you know, are, are in our classes and also don't know very much. Um, and then sort of uh, many students who are just curious and probably taking the class because it fills some sort of a diversity requirement that the university, um, you know, gen ed requirement they have to take. The most interesting conversations that we have between students who where identity comes up a lot is in the uh, Jewish humor class, which you won't be surprised to hear is a very popular class, Jewish humor. Everybody wants to take a class where they can, you know, watch uh, funny things and then try to analyze why it's funny. But some of our most interesting conversations revolve around who gets to tell what jokes, right? And yeah. 
Um, when do you know uh, jokes that if it's performed by a Jewish artist or a Jewish comedian fall into the range of Jewish humor? When do they become anti-Semitic? And that ends up being sort of always a fascinating discussion every single time. And then what do we do with Sasha Baron Cohen, right? And sort of like, uh, you know, how do we parse out what's Jewish humor and what's anti-Semitic humor and is it is it effective? So that always ends up being sort of the most uh, interesting area to explore between students because it does come down to issues of audience and prior knowledge and, you know, who gets the joke and is it insider humor or not? So um, it, it, it always ends up being very interesting to look at the class dynamic when that happens. I think we have time for one um, one more question, and I think uh, this is from um, from Amy Elman, and she's saying that um, thus far most of the panel confined anti-Semitism to far right examples, at, at least in the courses maybe that were being discussed. Um, how much success have any of you had in addressing the anti-Semitism that um, might 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 appear on some campuses under the auspices of of the left? Um, or the center, um, and uh, just keeping keeping in mind the time. If uh, you know, if anyone if anyone wants to answer that, that would be great. I can jump in to start, Rafa. Great, thank you. And I'll I'll be brief. Um, just to say that um, there's there's a couple of areas in this in the class that um, we're putting on for next semester where we'll engage with this. One is in the definitions of anti-Semitism, which many of you, if you've followed sort of the dueling definitions of, you know, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the Jerusalem, the Nexus, a lot of it revolves around sort of Israel and the question of where we put anti-Zionism, anti-Israel sentiment in the in conversations about anti-Semitism. So we're gonna engage with that right at the beginning of the class when we talk about definitions. Um, and, and then we actually have a whole week of the class or a whole module of the class, which um, has to do with, uh, you know, where do we, uh, when does anti-Israel or when do criticisms of Israel and anti-Zionism turn into anti-Semitism? And I'll just say, and I'm sure this is relevant to a lot of uh, people who are listening here, it's a very much a current issue, right? So yeah, we have like white nationalist movements and you know Charlottesville and uh, Holocaust denial and distortion that's rampant um, right now in the anti in the anti-vaxxer movement, but we're also seeing it in chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine and calls for boycott and divestment, and so we have to engage it from both sides, and that's we're trying to do that in the class. And Rafa, I'll just add a minute. I, I okay. felt it was something that I wanted to introduce immediately because if we didn't talk about it and students found, about, found out about this after the course, they'd wonder why there was silence. So we did read part of Deborah Lipstadt's book that dealt with this issue. And on as the class was on convergence and divergence of the two African-American and Jewish communities, I felt it was an important part to mention historically how the alliance, so to say, fell apart, how we rebuild or we might rebuild it today. So I did find it was really important to mention this from both sides and the students um, received it well, had a lot of questions, but um, did receive it well. Thank you. Great, I think so much of what you've showed today is it's how you present right and how you how you scaffold the issues to enable the students to engage thoughtfully and respectfully with each other on very complex issues but issues that are impacting them day to day on their campuses and through these courses i think really um uh uh they're able to um appreciate things in a different way i think you've really showed that um i, I really want to thank um you so much for this thought provoking panel um, to all the panelists and for what you're doing with these innovative, very special classes and courses. Um, and I wanna thank everybody who joined uh, in the audience. Um, we will uh, post this webinar to our, to our website. Um, and so you know, be able to view it again. And um, I'm really excited that your courses are the first in the syllabi bank. Um, which we'll be developing. There are a number of um, faculty members in AEN who teach 
on the topics also from different disciplines. So we'll be reaching out to them and adding to this to this bank. Um, so stay tuned, uh, everybody on the call for more uh, information and some more AN emails um, about, about that. Um, so on behalf of uh, the entire AN leadership, um, I wish those who are celebrating uh, a very happy Hanukkah. Um, goodbye and have a great rest of your day.